And I was shocked at the sight of this figure, this lonely, lonely figure. And I had a call my having a difficult time controlling my emotions. I remember gasping. I just couldn't believe what I was witnessing. Because I was a father. And I had young children. And I knew that they were at home in the safety and comfort with their mother. Yet here before me was this young boy abandoned by all, by everyone who received no information on the outside world, no communication from family or friends, no visits from human rights organizations because they're not permitted, or even visits from Canadian consular officials. That wasn't permitted either. And he wasn't even aware when I arrived there that his father had died. And that first image of Omar haunted me for years. This so very dejected, lonely child, abandoned by all. And every time I left Omar after a visit, I was aware that the fluorescent lights in his cell would remain on, that he would try to sleep the time away, and that the cold in his cell would prevent sleep, and that incessant lighting had divested him of his feel for night or for day. And over the course of any given month, Omar didn't know whether he would get to see the sun, have a conversation, or even have another visit from me. And throughout my years of visiting him in Guantanamo Bay, I never, ever saw him walk. He was always shackled to a floor. A military dossier that we obtained records that as a result of the unrelenting maltreatment of Guantanamo detainees, there have been several hundred suicide attempts. And the only way you can commit suicide in Guantanamo is if you chew on your wrists. You are so tied down, so chained, so protected. And a high percentage of detainees are on antidepressants and the dossier reports that at least 100 have become observably mentally ill as opposed to just depressed. I remember one time going by some cubicle by the cages. And I heard this man pray. But I'd never heard such desperation in anybody's voice as that time. This Muslim was praying to his God, to Allah. But the pain in that voice stunned me. It, 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 that cry in that prayer was just astounding. And, and Omar Khadr is often referred as a terrorist who committed a heinous crime by our government and that he pleaded guilty to charges without any backdrop to that plea. The, let me be clear here. The American military tribunal at Guantanamo Bay that convicted Omar was not a normal court, and that's a massive understatement. It was a pantomime of justice, removed from the normal American legal system and relying upon made-up rules and novel legal interpretations. Some would say it was simply a kangaroo court one worthy of a Middle Eastern dictatorship or Kafka short story. I go with the latter. Or as the Alberta Court of Appeal recently stated, in dryly damning language, the legal process under which Carter was held and the evidence elicited from him have been found to have violated both the Charter and international human rights law. That's from the Alberta, Alberta Court of Appeal. And the Supreme Court of Canada said as much both in 2008 in Canada 1 and 2010 in Canada 2. And, then, and the main evidence against him was a confession, as I earlier said, obtained years earlier under what any reasonable person would describe as abuse or torture. But your government doesn't talk about that. And before he pled guilty, I can tell you, it was made very clear that indefinite detention was on the table. 
that he faced, regardless of what the jury came out with, he faced indefinite detention. And at that point, he'd been nearly 10 years in Guantanamo, held in places that were entirely removed from the realm of law, where abuses and torture were standard operating procedure. And so who amongst us would not have taken that plea bargain to escape the water borders and the torturers? I can tell you, I had a hard time persuading him to take that deal. I breached every ethic as a lawyer. The only thing I didn't do was knock him down and hold him to the ground and force him to write and sign his name. He didn't want to, he didn't want to plead guilty. He didn't want to go back to Canada as a terrorist. And I persuaded him that things would be okay when you get back to Canada. And on and Omar's return to Canada almost two years ago, the Canadian government, in their wisdom, classified him as a maximum security risk, not only to Canada, but also to each and every prisoner in any prison in Canada. This 15-year-old guy. I remember being annoyed in Guantanamo Bay saying to, to military officers, are you telling me this is the only serious Taliban player in this prison? There's nobody else to put up for trial? And yet, our government made that security classification of him in the face of irrefutable evidence that I provided to victees in the transfer application that took place, including reports from authorities at Guantanamo Bay and Department of Foreign Affairs reports that described him as a good kid. I've just filed an affidavit in the Court of Queen's Bench in, in um, Edmonton as I'm making one of my numerous challenges. And in that affidavit is a record of everything I'm telling you, proof of everything I'm telling you. And since his arrival in Canada, Omar has been placed in some of the most notorious prisons. He was initially placed in Millhaven Penitentiary, and because he's such a terrible, dangerous individual, we locked him away for seven and a half months in isolation. Welcome to Canada, Omar. And then a guard, when he got let out, a guard asked him to, to work on the food line and pass out pieces of butter to these serious prisoners and make sure they only got one each. Well, you have to understand the culture of being, you have to be a tough guy in a prison or you better align yourself with tough guys. And so here's this innocent put on a food line which is one of the most dangerous areas in prison. It's where drugs pass, it's where messages pass. And here's this young man that tells this hard seasoned killer that he can only have one little bit of butter. So sad and tragic, really. And what does this guy try to do? He tries to stab him and then puts a contract on him. And so Omar is then put in isolation again, and I use that situation to get a move to Edmonton, Alberta, to Edmonton Max. And what did we do in Edmonton Max? Well, he's a Muslim. What do you do with Muslims? You put them on white supremacist units, so they get the shit kicked out of them within the first five minutes. So badly, so badly that the warden called me personally at my house on a Saturday night to come out and see him. And that was a, de a terrible day because I had never seen Omar so sad and so scared. He had put his trust in me, agreeing to enter into a plea bargain so he could return to the safety of Canada. And I was then faced with the sober reality that not only could I not keep him safe in Guantanamo, I couldn't keep him safe 
in Canada. In chronicling Omar's ordeal, I'm not simply describing shameful and appalling behavior towards a young Canadian youth that should shock the conscience of each one of us, or that he has managed against all odds to maintain an enduring faith in our common humanity, or that his truth has been able to leap prison walls and barriers because the government will not allow him to be heard. It is only, only by creating a climate of fear that it is easy for people such as you and I to accept that drastic measures must be taken in the interest of security, even if it means the suspension of civil liberties, compromising our values, or ignoring the rule of law. We realize that, you know, it's just simply for the greater good of society. It is then that we all fall into the lawlessness, the lawlessness that gave us Guantanamo Bay. Recently, on giving public notice, public notice that it is preparing legislation to allow extensive surveillance of its citizens by its intelligence agency, CSIS, Prime Minister Harper was quoted as saying, it is that judges have constrained the agency's powers in the name of preserving liberties. And that resonated with me because it was, there was similar language used by the Bush administration in setting out its national defense strategy in 2005. Because I recall what he told the American public. He said, our strength as a nation state will continue to be challenged by those who employ a strategy of the weak by using international media and judicial processes. And, and in Britain, around the same time, Tony Blair, on the point of leaving office, stated, it is a dangerous misjudgment to put civil liberties first. And they could all, each and every one of those individuals, could have benefited from the experience of Stella Remitting, former head of MI5, the British Security Service, who oversaw the IRA problem. And I represent at one time a famous IRA terrorist. And he was the real business. And she criticized not only her own country, another country's reaction to 9-11 as, as simply as excessive. She stated, it would be better that the government recognize there are risks. And rather than frightening people to pass laws which restrict civil liberties, precisely one of the objectives of terrorism, that we live in fear and under a police state. And, or they could have benefited from the wisdom of the U.S. Supreme Court Justice William Brennan in 1997, decrying past history. What did he say? He said, there is considerably less to be proud about and a good deal to be embarrassed about when one reflects on the shabby treatment civil liberties have received in the United States during times of war and perceived threats to national security. And after each perceived security crisis ended, the United States has remorsefully realized the abrogation of civil liberties was unnecessary but it has proven unable to prevent itself from repeating the error when the next crisis comes along. And I much prefer the view attributed by Benjamin Franklin, that he who would put security first before liberty deserves neither. In combating terrorism, we are fighting for more than the safety of our citizens, although that is an important objective, of course. We are also fighting for the preservation of our democratic way of life, our right to freedom of thought and expression, and our commitment to the rule of law. It is only by adhering to the, court of, to the rule of law are we able to define the boundaries of permissible and legitimate state action. For what it's worth, 
I would never have envisaged that the history of the new century would encompass the destruction and distortion of fundamental legal and constitutional principles that have been in place since the 17th century. We appear to have forgotten the lessons of the 17th century Star Chamber, where the accused were submitted to torture, to accusations based on secret evidence heard by a secret court while being shackled in the extremes of isolation. And the worst excesses of the past year should have sounded loud, loud alarms to each and every one of us, not the least because of, the, of that precise historic parallel to the Star Chamber. We are witnesses to habeas corpus being abandoned. I know that. I appeared in the US Supreme Court fighting for habeas rights for detainees in 2004. Guilt inferred by association, torture and rendition nakedly justified, and vital international conventions consolidated in the aftermath of the Second World War, the Geneva Conventions, the Refugee Conventions, and the Torture Convention, and more. They have all been deliberately avoided or ignored in the war of terror. I go on forever. But worse, far worse, as I stated earlier, we bequeath this social legacy to our children. So as I conclude, the story of Omar Khadr is not just about a boy, a young boy who was detained and abused. This story is also about us, about how we as individuals define ourselves as a society and what we are prepared to stand up for. If this could happen to a 15-year-old Canadian youth who is entitled to all kinds of international and domestic protections, then who is safe amongst us? And if we walk away from our duty to uphold human values, then who will be there to speak for us when our turn comes? Thank you. <laughs>